Se ci sono, sì. Thank you very much for coming and for uh, adding to your already very busy weeks. Also, there's additional uh, time in, uh, in the classroom. So this is not going to be a lecture. Okay? So the, the purpose of this meeting is to have a conversation, rather. So I'm acting here as a facilitator. I have a series of slides, but I will just show you questions, essentially. and. For today, this will be sort of open questions, in the sense that we don't know the answers. I, so for, for sure, I don't, to most of them. Uh, but it's more, more important to, to know and see how you, th you feel about these questions, what are your insights. So it's a, it's a matter of trying to, to communicate your, your, your opinions and your, and your feelings, right? Uh, Tomorrow there's an exam, this will be real questions. Okay, that's another thing. <laughs> but for today, that, that's, that's really more of a conversation. Um, so we have two uh, mics here. As much as the flow of the conversation allows you, you will, are invited to make them circulate among you. Uh, if not, not everything will be recorded, of course. Uh, but uh, just because uh, questions just come up and then it's better to, to follow the flow of the discussion rather than stopping by. But uh, since we have it, you just move it back if, if anyone wants to. to thank you, Luca. You're already working. <laughs> if anyone wants to intervene, you just move it along in the, in the audience, okay? You can, we can go with the, okay? Already given me instructions, okay? Thank you. So you see around and you, you let this move, okay? Again, it's not important. If it doesn't work, just shout. Fine. So just just to set the stage for discussion, uh, of course, when, when you talk about artificial intelligence, many things come to your mind. So what what do you, when, what's the first time, thing that comes to your mind when you talk about artificial intelligence? <laughs> if you want to ask a question already? Okay, yeah, ask a question. <laughs> I don't know if I can answer. <laughs> what's the question? Okay, this is going a long way. This is a question that is going a long way. Uh, so uh, I, I think I, I will just ask you to ask again this question later on. During. So the, my question is, what do you think about when you think about artificial intelligence? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Speak up. Yeah, you, you, don't, need, you don't need to be addressed. You just speak up. It, I 
I robot. Yeah, that, that's very. It's, it's a classical and, reference. And, uh, it's not silly. Yeah, exactly. So the issue there was how robots interface with humans, and I think that that's one of the main concerns, and we will be discussing this. Ethics, ethics of course. It, it's part of that. It's part of that, right? We we before we have to establish some some ethical framework in order to uh, relate with uh, with machine with other intelligences. So what are the boundaries of this machine learning tool? What can we expect to do? And what yeah, what are the expectations, and uh, do we want to sort of trace a boundary, or or is there a boundary, or is there an, an actual a limit, an intrinsic limit? That's a good question. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's a big point because that, that that's actually a point that touches on the, the very notion of what is intelligence itself, right? Uh, besides being artificial. Uh, yeah. Yeah, many times happens that uh, you start the discussion with kind of science fiction stuff that you no, this will this comes in the end. Wait, I, 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 <laughs> but but then, then it comes to like but uh, wait, are we already in some kind of like artificial world? Because I think that there is a lot of Okay, we sure. really notice, really notice <laughs> yeah, perhaps not. Perhaps we will keep on adapting. Yeah, we can we can discuss this later on. Other suggestion about what what comes to your mind? I mean, so what comes to mind is flexibility. What I mean by that is to encounter things and say artificial intelligence is so hard that it is maximizing the capabilities of the universe, and thus that will definitely do a lot of things. That is, artificial intelligence has hopefully intelligence can can fully do that, which we can say actually we can change our world of stars. Yeah, the, the design of the goals of, of, of artificial intelligence is very important and would be one of the... Uh, anything from the back? Uh, perhaps first uh, the movie Matrix and the fact that how long can we remain as masters instead of slaves uh, to the artificial, artificial intelligence. And the second thing, uh, as Diego said, uh, what is the difference between human mind and AI? And perhaps we are just uh, big bags of calculations the same as robots are. Okay, so uh, there are Google. Google comes to your mind, sure, of so course. When you, when you see the threshold of interface, when we, when we go to deal with a fellow human, we have a way of dealing with them, which is different from, for example, how we deal with animals. Yeah, exactly. We recognize them and intelligence and dignity. And so when, when you see this, where is this threshold is, Okay, exactly. So we will try, that, that's the purpose of today's uh, meeting. Try to walk you through all these kind of questions in a slightly organized way, uh, <coughs> in which, again, I reiterate, I have no particular standing in this. I'm not an ethicist, I'm not a, a, law, a lawyer, neither a lawmaker, uh, even though recently it seems very easy to become a lawmaker in Italy. Uh, but uh, I'm none of that, so I will discuss from the viewpoint of a, of a of my personal uh, uh, take on that, but uh, it's just as good as anyone else. Uh, so one, one thing that is, I think it's helpful is just to, to wipe out the field from many complicated things is just to recall you to, to most of the students that, that actually our, our definition of intelligence is very low level. It's, uh, it's actually wants to encompass as many possible options that are available. So it's enough to have some agent which perceives the environment or reacts to that in an adaptive manner uh, in this uh, uh, loop of uh, actions and perception uh, sometimes uh, such as in, in robots uh, or in some arguments is directed towards a particular goal. Okay, That's a very basic definition but it's very important because it allows to encompass many different life forms. Not only humans, animals, vegetables, and machines. Right? So the way I think a way that which is particularly useful of, of framing the discussion about artificial intelligence is in sense that we, we must realize that we live in a sort of ecosystem in which there are different agents and they interact. So we're used to ecosystems like, like okay, plants and animals and 
and then humans, etc. But perhaps we have to look at this thing as, as a larger, larger ecosystem. And then we have to care about the relationship between uh, the various uh, agents that, that are present in the, in the ecosystem. And as, 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 a, as already emerged from, me, from this discussion, one, one very important concern is about uh, how do we feel about artificial intelligence. More than how to define it often, it's just how do, what's our perception of it? Uh, and, and sometimes it's shaped by the literature or by the movies. And, and, and this means of communication may play a very important role in uh, uh, addressing the, uh, the public opinion in, in ways that might be uh, good or bad um, sometimes, right? So, so the question that I'm asking, again, to you is not what do you think about it, but what feelings you have when when you think about artificial intelligence. There's, there's a whole spectrum of this, right? Going from expectations to fears, right? So can you tell me some, some of those? What do? First of all, let, let's just make a very, very quick survey about the overall feeling. Do you feel more excited and with great expectations? Those who feel like this, please raise your hands. Yeah? And then who is more inclined to be, let's say, from suspicious or uh, agnostic to <laughs> outwardly possessed with fear? Can we be both in the same yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Obviously, that, that's, that's probably, I think, that uh, the thing that captures most of the feeling that we have. We both are, have some expectations and some, uh, some fears, right? So this is, uh, and, and, and concerning the expectations, what, what are specific instances by which uh, uh, you, you think, oh, okay, artificial intelligence, my dream would be that it's able to? Uh, to make the life of people a little uh, easier. Uh, yeah. There are many painful jobs in terms of transforming other jobs. Improve, improve the quality of life. Mm -hmm. I know that some like image recognition systems are used for medical purposes. Very often, some tumors could be recognized uh, using the uh, machine. I mean, the neighborhood. Yeah. So yeah. But that's absolutely something we'll discuss. Beneficial level, certainly, because in the sense that yes, we are developing smarter, smarter machines to do this kind of tasks, but we should be also prepared in the case of. I mean. Is this an expectation? No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's a. I'm going to say it's a fact that we. Because if we are creating machines that do only tasks and then these machines should, in a case, develop consciousness. Okay. You, you want to rush me too much into this <laughs> this topic scenario. We will get a little, some, somehow later to, to this, but just a little. Right, I mean, I mean, I'm thinking, let me, I, I will make an example, right? What concerns me. I have a couple of things in mind, but maybe some of you share the same thing. One of my dreams would be instant translation. So I go everywhere. I just listen to people, I understand what they say, I talk, and they understand what I say. Good. <laughs> we, still, nonetheless, I'm speaking English here, which is not my native language. <laughs> so, something accessible to everyone, of course. Yeah, that's my dream. I, it's a small dream. Again, so says, yeah, that, that's, that's a delicate issue, of course. That's a delicate issue. That's a relationship with work, okay? Sorry, but that <laughs> still remains my dream. <laughs> and uh, and second dream, assistance to the elderly. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You disagree? Okay, I said. I like I said. Okay, it's not. It's my own assistance to elderly people, to those ones who leave need assistance, uh, uh, rather than having families or. <laughs> Operators uh, spend a lot of time. Thus, maybe our automation, mindful automation, is, is one way of alleviating for many, many of these tasks. Which actually, in the West, with an increasing population of more aged people, is, is becoming a, it's, a, it's a big toll on, on, on a certain part of the society. You might well see, okay, this is not a problem in 75% uh, of the world, but uh, that's like a, just like I said, it's my own. Expectation. So you might have some others. Yeah, please. 
you know, uh, I really worry for my privacy because the big brother is watching us. And the problem is that uh, he has more facilities to use better systems, better machines. So in past, we killed each other with a stone. Now we kill each other with very new high-tech technologies. So yes, of course, a lot of uses. You can use instant translation or such thing. But you know, I now check, I use a free application. Then it shows me some advertisement that knows exactly what I want. Yes, it's good. But uh, what about my privacy? Okay. I really worry so, about so, privacy. Yeah, it, it seems that we want to move about uh, the fears. <laughs> Pardon? I mean, uh, to use machine learning to, to do many things in physics, I think it's something. Advancing science, yeah. That's you, helping us in, in intellectual tasks, yeah, sure. Yeah, you go. Uh, <laughs> I even dream in a war where all the uh, repetitive tasks are okay. have gone and only creative jobs are, are existing. Yeah, transformation of, of work, yes. Yeah. Uh, to what you said, I'm a bit concerned because if society is not ready to evolve on this, it means just that machines can do all the manual jobs and... Like, Likely, more people are going to be jobless and so societal Fine. crack. Great. So that, that, that's exactly what I wanted. Sorry, I, I just have to move on a little bit, because otherwise we just don't, don't progress. But that, that's exactly the outcome that I wanted to reach, OK? Because that shows you how entangled the two things are, right? So to every expectation, it comes with sort of a downside. So I'm happy for the universal translator, and then uh, who study to Many languages uh, then uh, sees uh, the risk of getting no job uh, in time. And all these other things that you say, these things things just come together, right? And this is exactly what, what many surveys, which are more systematic than the one we're doing here, actually confirm. It's, it's, a, it's a big, complicated issue. It's, it's, it's very important not to try to simplify. So many of you are physicists or scientists, so we like to say, well, let's simplify the things and cut and chop it. And, but this is one of the things that you don't want to do here, OK? It's an inherently complex problem, which we have to address with care and making particular attention to the fact that there are always two or many sides to, to the same thing. So people, you see, uh, there's a whole spectrum of things going from mistrust and uh, anxiety to excitement and optimism. Uh, I think, actually, all of us have these things in different proportions, and that, that's, that's the, 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 the initial realization that we have to, to deal with. Uh, so like we said, both expectations and fears are present. Some of them, some of them, is so, is so, some of them have, have a, a more practical dimension. So for instance, lots of people are concerned about, oh, AI will take away our job. Okay, we will end up being jobless and is this going to make us richer in the sense that we have more time, we do more creative job, or is it just going to let us jobless and that's it? Uh, so this is a practical concern, and it's direct implication. And it's the, the thing that we have to think about and to face first uh, as, as members of, of a society. Because uh, famously, it was famously, say, famously said by, uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I don't remember the, the name of the, of the economist who said that. Uh, it's, it's much more likely that humans will ra raise against machines rather than robots overcoming over humans. Okay? The, the, the riskiest scenario is that there is a complete repulsion towards uh, a technological innovation, which is it's a phenomenon that occurs often and reproduces itself over the history. If something uh, arrives in, in too quick a question, and it doesn't, uh, there's no background to, to integrate this new technology into our systems of values and beliefs, so then it, it can easily get repelled with results that not necessarily are good for humanity as a whole on the long term, right? So it's, it's important to, to, to address these fears and try to, to find out ways of making uh, the, the, 
the impact of AI more, more friendly and, and, uh, and, and less uh, disruptive, okay? So you see, when, when you have to weigh the, the pros and cons, for people, for instance, uh, it's, it's very happy to have a uh, digital assistant for, uh, for, um, for low, low uh, uh, issues. Uh, so it's, it would be better to have affordable legal advice than to preserve the job of lawyers, right? So this is a very aggressive statement uh, towards lawyers. Uh, but for, so, for some other sectors of society, that, that's, that's pretty different, as you can, as you can easily imagine. Uh, so... Yeah, these surveys are essentially done in Western countries, so they don't represent uh, in full the society. But these are, at the current stage, the only ones that are that are available on this on this scale. But certainly, it, geographically, it, it it can and will probably change a lot. Yeah. Um, just something I'd like to know is that it seems so far what we've been looking at has not been so much, I guess out there of artificial intelligence itself, but rather how and why it is used, in what way it is applied. Yeah, but that, that's right. what causes fear. I mean, in itself, it, it, I don't, I mean, it, 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 it's, the fear comes from the relationship with, the, with artificial intelligence, not in abstract as, a, as an entity, right? Is that, that what you're saying? Um, I mean, yes, but perhaps, say, something like artificial intelligence, I mean, because we have different kinds of intelligence, right, be it specialized, generalized, or God help us, super intelligence, right? Surely that's something different if, it, if it's no longer a question yeah. of human operators. But yeah, yeah. So, so that's another class of concerns, which I would call more existential, right? So is the fate of humanity going to change uh, because of the arrival of artificial intelligence on a large scale, and in which ways? So there's one dimension, which is more... Uh, uh, how, we, how we, we tell, will it impact society and our way of living? And another way is uh, how we, will it impact uh, the existence of humanity and how we, we transform it, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you, bo yeah. both, side, both situations are present. We, we try to discuss both of them if, if, we, if we can. Uh, Thank you. So first question that, that is, is present in the, in the back of the mind of many people who were interviewed, are, are you worried about not finding your job or since you're a pretty young sector for most of you, would be not finding your job because of artificial intelligence. So maybe that the things that you're learning now will not be uh, irreplaceable soon. So how, how many of you do, do feel a sort of competition with, with artificial intelligence for the job market? <laughs> this, is, this is very, very well explainable. OK, so you, you, don't, you don't feel worried about this. So do you think that your parents should Should be worried, your parents, about the impact of artificial intelligence. Okay, two more there. Fine. And yeah. Really linked to AI. How do, you, how do we conceive the notion of job? What is job meaning? Is it simply an activity? Is it simply? This is not uh, linked to AI, especially. It's, it's a, it's a, so I agree. It's a general, it's a general problem about innovation, and the innovation at hand here is AI. Okay, so we're discussing a general problem of impact of innovation on society with this particular case. Only that it seems at this moment might be that we are just uh, uh, overstating the impact. So it seems that it's point that, that this impact could be disruptive in many fields. So that's why we want to discuss this. So it's not something which is specific to AI, but that's, that's what, we want, what we want to address here. Absolutely, absolutely. But the political level has a consist constituency, and we are the constituency. Okay, so that, that's, that's what we can do now, just discuss. And the job market changes a lot, changes continuously, and yes, we have to probably to adapt to this, uh, most of you think that you don't really need any adaptation. That's good, okay? Because probably you you are already habituated to adaptation, and you can you can handle new situations, and that's good. Yes, please. Uh, I think there are many ways to tackle this problem. Uh, it's like it's, uh, 
it, it really is, is something between capitalism and social democracy. Uh, we can pay people who are losing jobs to robots to, for, for a time and help them uh, create their own, their new abilities if they, if they are able to do so. Uh, I think uh, when you're America, this would sound, sound funny, but uh, I think in Europe this is something that people can agree on. Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. There's, a, there's absolutely the, this uh, need to uh, accompany this process and to, to preserve some, some parts of the society who are more uh, fragile and susceptible to, to be strongly affected. In the, uh, because there would be, these things have happened in the past, right? When new big innovation came into the job market, there's always a gap period in which the transformation is, is, is rapid and then it takes time to adjust. To, to eventually, perhaps, there, there will be far more job in that sector than there were in the beginning. But certainly the transformation affects very strongly some, some layers of society, especially people who have been doing the same job for many years and have less ability of moving to an economy which has much, much more of short works and uh, uh, other different, completely different uh, uh, scheme of how work uh, uh, proceeds, right? Uh, because I think if you look deeper, uh, the overall wealth of the society will increase. And the, the problem is only the distribution of the wealth. And if we, if we agree to uh, help those people, it's good for everyone. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very right. And that's, a, that's a big concern. Because another thing that, that is about artificial intelligence, if it were of an impact, it will be highly unequal across the world. It will impact in very different ways in, according to the uh, geographical and political situation of each country and its history. So it's... it's highly prone to enhance inequalities. And so we have to take a, an eye on that for sure. And there is also perhaps the question of who is processing robots or artificial intelligence? And uh, is, will it be like an open source artificial intelligence or will it be protected? And uh, so what about, um, that's, uh, I don't know, I know nothing about, but uh, for instance, I'm sure that uh, uh, armies throughout the world are developing their own artificial intelligence and brain machine, and so is there any... Yeah, absolutely. Is artificial intelligence a common good? Assuming it's good. Okay. So, so this is the question, actually. Will, will jobs disappear? Will some jobs disappear? Yeah. Already some of them have been disappeared. Can you mention one? For example, there are a lot of chats between, for example, when you contact some company, even machine, you can I am experienced that. Retailing, uh, yes, retailing. Okay. There are also some uh, new shops that are completely. There are some new shops that are completely automated. Um, I mean, yeah, my okay. father owns the shop, but it's going to be a, a job that is going to be. It's okay. going to disappear. Retailing, all these things will be will be strongly impacted if they are not already. Uh, so. Transportation, our oh, controls, yes, it's basically uh, totally automated, yeah, yeah. Security also. Security. Security? Yeah, I, say, I say security. Uh, which, which because, kind of security in mind? Uh, I mean, probably we will be at a point where we will no longer need uh, actual people for security purpose, but uh, probably machine will be more rea reliable. That's interesting. That's interesting because, again, this... Uh, touches upon the problem of uh, interaction between humans and robots, yep. okay? There are robots patrolling uh, some, some, co some boroughs or some, some, uh, uh, some places and they get vandalized a lot, okay? Which is again something which touches upon how you, would you relate to that? It's a cop and on top of that, it's even a robot. Yep. <laughs> okay. I think I framed the, the problem. <laughs> okay, so again, let's, let's, uh, let's see what people say. So this is a result of a survey which has been published on a, on a paper. So this is a scientific paper about artificial intelligence. It's a survey among participants to all these big conferences like uh, uh, NITS, etc. So uh, uh, they asked to the participants, so this, this is a survey among experts. Uh, what jobs and tasks will be taken over by, by machines? And you see that some of them are, are, are pretty, have a pretty short horizon, right? So 
transcribing speech, folding laundry, okay, cleaning the house in general is something that's, that's gonna be hopefully taken over by machines very soon. It, it's not particularly alarming, okay? In that case, it, people feel it's very beneficial. I'm happy to have some small robot which cleans after me all the mess that I make. Uh, and then we start with something, okay, uh, drive a truck, oh, 10 years horizon. That's pretty, of course, these are estimates, right? It's a guessing game, but it's a guessing game done by many people who, who are acknowledged, acknowledgeable in the subject. And this is probably a, gonna have a significant impact on the, on the way job will be transformed. Uh, but then the interesting thing is that let, let's take this as a particular example because I think it's, it's particularly telling. Automated trucks. Okay? This would be really a boon, would be a wonderful thing, okay? Because you don't have people who are driving trucks for hours on the highway and then they get distracted and uh, lots of accidents, okay? This could have really a positive impact on, uh, uh, on public health because you, you really remove some, some of the risk that, that uh, uh, is, is inherent to, the, to transportation on, uh, uh, on trucks. But is this really gonna disappear? When you look into the scenarios that, that people in that sector of transportation outline for this sector, what they say is that actually they have in mind the following idea. There will still be drivers taking trucks from the warehouses where the material is to the entrance of the highway. And then from that point on, the truck will be automated. So it will be driverless, basically. Who controls the, 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 the truck? There will be another operator sitting in a, on his armchair with many screens connected to all the sensors, a joystick, and keeping track of what is happening and remotely controlling this truck. That's the scenario that they depict, okay? So would that mean that this job of truck driver has disappeared? So in this scenario, it's just being radically changed. Perhaps numbers will change. There will be needing of less people. That's possible, of course. It's difficult to make an estimate on that. But certainly it will be a job which will be largely modified because there will be no long haul uh, transportation by a single person. Most of the job you could do it from nine to five or in shifts, okay? So that's perhaps, it's a very optimistic scenario. Perhaps we don't, we will not ever see uh, self-driving trucks because the integration with the ordinary messy traffic is too much of a difficult problem to be taken in practice. Perhaps on the contrary, in 10 years, this will be the rea reality on all, all of our highways, we don't know. But it's, it's important to, to notice that at first sight you will say, okay, this means no truck drivers around in 10 years. But probably it's not the case. You as a truck driver will be required to have different skills. It's just video gaming. Yeah, that's good investment, okay? So it's, it's, a, it's an old, this thing is just an old metaphor. Uh, it's a metaphor of continuous learning, right? It's always like this. Innovation is a, is a, is a stair which is going down and you wanna walk up, okay? And you have to keep the pace in order to keep your job. New jobs are up there, old jobs are down there, okay? And it can be painful for, for other people to keep up with that, right? It requires a lot of effort uh, to, to, to learn new things but it's a process that's important, especially when these things speed up, like uh, when new innovation comes in. Ooh. Yeah, I know, yeah. Yeah, that's very sad, right? Okay, but before you blame me and tell me, okay, that, that was really crude, you're, you're, you're just heartless. <laughs> let, so let, let me give you a little bit of context, okay? Of context for this. So this, this, is, this is at the opening of a new mall, okay? And all these people were in line because they were distributing hamburgers for free at the floor, up. And these guys were trying to shortcut by using the stairs, okay? <laughs> so you don't feel so much compassion now that you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Okay. So, so this this is okay. This is sort of uh, yeah. Let's move on. <laughs> so this is this is a harsh metaphor, but of course the point was exactly that the one that was raised before. We need policies that help people climbing up the stairs without just being left to themselves and uh, struggle and fight and then yeah. Yep. Okay, the point is that camera is not a machine which can see, and that's why we can do something else. When we have, oh, let's call it an AI limit, in the AI limit set, they can do everything. So what does it mean that, okay, instead of a truck driver, we create a manager that, so we another robot can do that. When, or when they are populated enough, because of the democracy, they can vote, and okay, they no, you know, you're, go, you're going full full throttle into the this topic scenario. Uh, might well happen. I don't know. Yeah, we, we we will we will probably react to this. So this is one. Time, I, I wanted to discuss this later, but it's probably the, the good time now. When you think about this this topic scenario, it's it's always funny because it's just like now there are robots and everything else is just like the same, right? So we just project ourselves. 50 years ahead, only on top of that there are super intelligent robots. But what what has happened in meanwhile? <laughs> but the problem can be mentioned in this way, how we can understand that we are not a type of artificial Okay, now you're pushing really too far. Okay. <laughs> I will I will give you Elon Musk number and you can discuss it later. <laughs> <laughs> now the important thing is that at some point if there is gonna be more and more AI we have to establish some relationship with it. And one of the key points is trust or mistrust. Okay. It's really a relation with, with algorithms, with the outcome of algorithms, with the information that we provide. Okay. So that's the question. Generally speaking, do you trust AI? I know it's a buggy question. It's very, it's very yeah, do you have a I would say that it depends on the task. Because, yep. for example, we were talking about I robots. I was thinking about the scene where the robot finding the cow which had fallen in the river, yeah. the river of the ocean, I don't remember, decides to save uh, with meat instead of the children because he had a greater chance of survival. Exactly. So, would you, would you? In that situation, no. I would definitely not trust AI, but in other situations, maybe I, I would. Okay, uh, of course. I, I mean, everybody trusts Roomba. It, it's, a, it's a little bit, we trust Google Maps, that, that's a, because, the, because we checked it, right? If it were to just to, to, I mean, to, it, to fail us very frequently, we, we wouldn't trust it, right? So, but, uh, there was a recent event, I don't know if it's in Google, they put two AIs to talk, and they did their own language. And yeah, we, so, sorry, I can't interrupt you, because we, we'll discuss about this. Yeah, there's something I, I want to, yeah, please. Absolutely, we don't know anything about her, about AI. Really we we tend to be very distrustful. So our priority, our very priority is trust level. Our priority is. In some societies, we are more trustful. Unless proved otherwise. <laughs> In other societies, we are very untrustworthy. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, taking it further, you know, would we trust a stranger? Would we trust a stranger who wrote that AI? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you see, it's 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 a very delicate issue. So I will, now I will try to give you some contrasting examples, okay? Because my task here is to confuse you, okay? <laughs> so I will, I will give you one example in which you sort of, it's, it's a bit creepy. Another example in which you say, okay, no, that, that's good, okay? Uh, yeah, you, but we have a question there or intervention? Well, uh, as he says before, uh, it depends on the task because, uh, for example, I mean, uh, I was talking about the, the cancer treatment by AI. They can uh, find a cancer, and it's not a probably they can it's do it. It's not a treatment; it's a diagnosis. Sorry, uh, diagnosis. Okay, 
and they can do it probably better than any human because they have much greater uh, computational power, let's say, but there are probably some other tasks in which they can they cannot be trusted. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it depends on the case. If it's short, short, okay, okay. I, I can ask. make just another example on a situation where I could or couldn't trust an AI. Yeah. For example, if uh, war robots are built with AI, I would definitely do not trust a robot that has been programmed to you know, kill me or hurt me. While on the other side, if uh, an AI robot was built to you know, rescue people after an, earth an earthquake or a flood, for example, that would be much more trustful. I, I, have, I have a more compelling example on this, which it's very much on the subject, just a second. So, first of all, let me show you this, okay? This is something uh, from, from, a, from real science research. Do I need to explain? So this is real-time manipulation of a, of a video. No. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a, <laughs> there's a camera which is capturing the the face, it's building a representation of his face and it's planting into a video. In this case, it's George W. Bush. There will be Putin soon. <laughs> Perhaps many of the some things. Yeah, how do we know? It's a, that's the problem of trust, right? It's just like you trust your eyes because they haven't failed you, okay? But then you trust your ears because you hear directly the meaning. But if there is a translator in between, would you trust it? Perhaps less. Now, machines are an interface between us and the outer world, right? So do we trust them? You see how it works, right? It's a totally neutral image which is manipulated in real time. So anything which is now transmitted real time, you are not, you are not at all expected to believe, even if it's happening right now just because it's passing through some interfaces before getting at you. So uh, clearly, it's a, it's a concern, right? It's a concern. It's a concern which has motivated people to think, okay, perhaps we, we have to push on the brake. Let us talk, give us time to think and to uh, make it more progressively or let us just stop it altogether. Who is of, of, of this opinion, generically, that we should put some brakes on this process? Two, three, Maybe four? just a little bit. Yeah, of course, yes. <laughs> and who is just more uh, inclined to let it evolve, and then we'll see where it goes? The people will just push ahead anyway. I, I think people will? Yeah, they already push ahead anyway. Yeah, I think, I think we can stop Do it. you think, really? Yeah. Oh, just, just like the GMOs, right? Yeah. So people will push it that anyway. Really? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Uh, Some things which are substantial innovations can get at the wrong angle with society and be bounced off at full speed. GMOs is one big example of this. Big problem of communication. Which then you, you might have your own opinion, okay? I have mine. But this is out of question that there was a big communication problem about what these things could do and what they, in what they are different from what people have been doing for thousands of years. Just this takes place at an accelerated rate. This message hasn't gone through at all. And same things could happen for artificial intelligence. If something that could be potentially good, then you give some, some kind of examples like this. And, ah. Sorry, can you repeat the example? GMOs. GMOs. GMOs are definitely perceived by a large fraction of the society, of common people, as something evil. No, no AI. No, no AI. It's just an example taken from science communication. Just to, just to have an idea of the kind of problems that might emerge. And then you could have a short-term effect that you don't know. It's even worse. Yeah, of course. You, know, you cannot stop it altogether just because everybody decides for its own. So yeah. it, it's, it might be very, very difficult to plant a global policy on this. 
So let, let, let's go to this point that was raised before because, uh, again, I think it's particularly illuminating. So would you trust AI for a medical diagnosis? It's, it's a terribly bad, badly formula, formulated question, okay? You should know this in advance. It's a, it's a trap. <laughs> would you, but I, I'm asking, raise your hand. Would, who would trust an AI for a medical diagnosis? With some caveats. Okay. <laughs> good. Lots of hands raised. Very good. Now I'm telling you that the diagnosis is uh, a mental disorder. With some caveats. You still agree? <laughs> you still agree? Okay. Yeah. No, what the point I'm, I'm making here is that actually there's a huge variety of situations in which AI might be extremely helpful and others in which it's very difficult to imagine how it can, can impact positively medicine at this stage. Okay? So one situation where you expect to have great advantages is, is sort of obvious, and it's dermatology. So there was a dermatologist uh, at one of these sessions that I had a few nights ago, and he was horrified. But uh, that's the thing. I mean, it's something which is now on the cover of this journal. And uh, he, the task of a dermatologist is to classify. Experience. He has seen many, many <coughs> lesions, distinguishing them from innocuous uh, moles. And then the dermatologist, she or he, is able to tell the difference. And now you can do this in an automated way, and the performances are already exceeding the ones by a panel of dermatologists. So in this case, I would go for fully 100%. But then if the thing is subtler, if you have some other problem, medical problem, which is more complex and relates to your lifestyle, etc., do we have sufficient knowledge in such a complicated thing? We, we should really be able to know ourselves as humans. And perhaps sometimes a human can understand us better based on something which is not easily put down on paper with the classifications with a plus or minus. Perhaps it will come in due course. But uh, at the time... Perhaps uh, my sister in Europe knows better than uh, anybody how I changed in time. Like, uh, I was normal, now I have some disorder and it started searching the same stuff. Yeah, you know, you know, but the point is that now you're starting to search for some strange stuff, and then tomorrow there's a police knocking at your door and says, uh, No, but only for the diagnosis. That's a diagnosis. Yeah, okay. Not for the cure. I mean, you diagnose and then you don't do anything? Yeah, no, neither I do. Neither I do. I'm just asking questions. <laughs> Rest assured. Yeah, I understand what you say. I understand what you say. There is this power, but if in this case that's something which is pretty transparent, once the diagnosis is made by the computer, there will be a doctor assessing and then deciding, okay, let's have this removed. And the procedure is pretty simple. But if the disease or the, the health problem is more complex than that, it's difficult to transform this diagnosis into treatment without having an additional complicated uh, interaction with humans uh, Still, I don't think it's it's about the time. Maybe actually artificial intelligence can help us merge different branches of medicine because the skin disease is never processed in disease. It is connected to many other regions of medicine. The doctors don't talk about it, and so the artificial intelligence can the cross vision. Yeah, that, that, that that's a very very interesting scenario. I, I would be extremely uh, excited by that. Yeah. I mean, for medicine, it's, it's interesting, but the point is, so on, on your question whether uh, an, an AI system would be able to diagnose a subtle disease, maybe like a mental disorder, well, this is, of course, uh, difficult to say, but uh, for sure, the moment that we will be able to collect and integrate the data in a broader sense, we may be able to, to get a much deeper knowledge, but there is a problem. And the problem is that as humans now, whenever a particular you know, comes to, to some very delicate issue, we would like to understand why. And artificial intelligence devices like deep learning don't tell us why. They are not transparent. They are not transparent. They are black boxes. 
So this is a many, many layers and different issues coming up here, very, very interesting. So one of them is, there is a tension here between how many data you want to give. For instance, if I take a photograph of a mole, I'm happy to share it. I would, I would add it to this database because this contributes to the health, not mine, not only mine, yours and my children, etc. So I'm very happy to share data about this. For other things, it might be more complicated, right? So there's a trade-off between how much you want to share and how much you want not to share. Yeah, but uh, we share who has access to this? It's true, but also we share a lot of data already, even of our health. So Absolutely. Just because you know, it's uh, we get something in exchange which is free or, or almost free. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it's it's. Really it's No, but it's 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 in the it's another it's it's another thing it's another tool it's towards improving the performance. So, like Lucas said, we cannot diagnose this, but if we provide more data, perhaps this will be better. But on the same side, if you do this, there will be side effects which are difficult to predict, and uh, you might be worried, and then you have all these Fitbits sending your data around, and then uh, tomorrow an insurance company buys them all. And then uh, they say, no, you cannot get your life insurance because I've seen from your heartbeat rate that you have a, uh, you are 90% likely to develop a, a heart disease in the next 10 years. Uh, not, not you, of course. <laughs> 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 Neither, yeah. <laughs> Neither me. You're talking about this, this topic. I'm literally reading for, uh, one, one article that says how Target figured out a teen girl was pregnant before her father did. And it's just that a uh, girl was buying in Target, uh, the store, and she has an ID. So she is buying, and the uh, Target is, is mining the data mm -hmm. to, to make recommendations and everything. And what Target decided to do was to send her coupons of baby teams and, uh, yes, and yes. Uh, offers in, for, for pregnant women. And so the father of the, the teenager called Target saying, hey, why are you doing why are you sending this to my girl? And the target says, hey, you should talk to your girl. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody yeah. knew she was pregnant, just target. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and it, it was just uh, data mining. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, as you so, know, you can kind of resist this kind of behavior of the digital camp of buying things that you want to use, right? I mean, the artificial intelligence is giving us the forms and the forms. As humans, we can kind of resist yeah so sorry sorry to interrupt you, you can you can go on with the discussion I think I think it's very interesting so let, let me just move a little bit forward so the fact that you cannot just give to artificial intelligence all of the job except in some particular cases means that it's very important to work side by side with artificial intelligence. And while this is sort of perhaps familiar with you, I mean, or medical doctor which uses several diagnosis mechanisms and uh, way to compute, uh, to predict, uh, diagnose, uh, diagnose uh, diseases, if you interact with an algorithm, it's, it's something which is pretty neutral. But then things change when, when you have to interact with a physical entity. So you have to work side by side with a robot, which is something which moves, occupies space. Now these things are already here. And, and they pose a challenge, okay? So on one side there is the, the, this point that we were raising before about uh, uh, policing with robots, which of course is a very delicate issue. To understand how delicate it is actually, is that there are robots that w which deliver pizza, okay? They are nice, roundish bots, very much Star Wars-like uh, objects that get their pizza, and the pizza goes from the pizza shop to the house, and then they get the money, they get back. So it's pretty innocuous, right? So they get vandalized horribly. Why is that? Because people are stupid. <laughs> yeah. 
because you don't relate to this. They all, look at these things is moving around, etc. Now, now think about something which is doing partly is doing your job or is helping you, but it also somewhat sort of changing the way you relate with it. Exactly, it's something asserting power. Okay, this is why white people vandalize. I'm better than this machine, etc. But now, you know, this, these robots exist. They exist in the hospitals, even in Italy, which is not probably the, 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 the most advanced technology uh, country. So these robots just go around and deliver uh, treatments, uh, and they help uh, taking care of cleaning, etc. And they're very efficient. They share space with uh, uh, nurses and doctors. And nurses and doctors have been trained on how to interact with those robots. I mean, if you, if you encounter a robot, it will stop. It will not crash on you. They just don't roll over you. They stop by and then allow you room to move. This slows, slows them a lot. So as they've been spending more and more time in, uh, uh, in the hospital, people have been able to more fluidize this movement. So that they now move around in a very fluid way. And then when, you, when a nurse encounters a robot, it just walks around, okay? So it's just like helping each other doing their job in a very, very simple and basic way, which is not just making an obstacle to the other. Or if a robot just gets stuck in a corner, which might happen, then you just will help him help it go away from the corner, right? So this, these are issues about dividing space and contributing together. And you have to have some very simple and basic ethical behavior with, towards that robot, right? You have to behave well and expecting. So it's not the high issues of saving a human's life and deciding whether it's uh, what is best in the, in the humanities, but it's really everyday sharing. And this also is, is one of the small steps which is always overlooked in the, in the dystopic scenario. Actually, having confidence, having sharing space with robots physically, occupying your space, and then interacting with them and seeing that things can get along is something which probably will shape our, our feeling about what robots can do in the, in the, in the future. So, and again, it, this, this idea of confidence and trust. So you, you, there are some tasks that you are willing to, to, to give to robots, uh, some others less, okay? It, it, it's a very wide spectrum. No problem with cleaning your house and folding your, uh, your laundry. Some other things are more tricky. So one, this is one of the questions that I usually ask. Who is, who is okay with this? You are a very educated audience, okay? <laughs> that's absolutely the case, so that's no problem with that. Again? Okay. This is also pretty much skewed, so I would like to hear something from people who would never buy a self-driving car. Yeah, could, could, could you please uh, elaborate? This is just because I don't drive a car, not because I don't okay, trust no, the car. No. That's a perfectly legitimate question. Okay, I won't say that you are a control freak. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a, there's a pleasure of doing some things that you don't want to just give up, okay? That, that's, that's perfectly legitimate. And other, other motivations? The same. The same, the same, good, okay. It's not about, so you, I, I understand, it's not about being, not trusting what the, the self-driving car would do, right? It's about the pleasure of driving, right? So you sort of have in your mind the idea that okay, this is a thing that which probably can be can be can get to the point where it saves human lives and improves on uh, on this. Okay, this is a, a, a highly. Pre please. Places. Like I've stayed in like different country places and the traffic condition in different countries are really different. Like for example, the traffic in China, in Hong Kong, uh, here or the US are all completely different. So if like the cars developed by an American country and those developers can, may not, may, they may like ignore some, for example, some uh, strange conditions in China. So in this case, I would definitely not buy a self-driving car made by American company in China. 
Okay. The, these things are just too that, complicated. That's already something which, which unfolds all the complexity of the thing in itself. But before discussing this, let me just show you that uh, this is a survey. And would you feel, Americans, would you feel uncomfortable about an AI flying an airplane, 70%? Americans what? <laughs> what? If there's a problem. There's a problem of perception. There's a problem of communication. That's that's what I'm saying. It's about the same if you ask uh, if the Earth is five thousand years old. It's like uh, yeah. Okay. But, I, mean, okay. I, I don't. I don't want to go on that on that point. Okay. Uh, but you clearly see there are some tasks which are now okay. Well, we're okay with that. Cooking your meals. You don't expect to be poisoned by a machine. It's, there's a lot of assumptions here, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, that, that's a problem for all surveys, right? Uh, driving a car, two thirds of the people would feel uneasy with that. This this doesn't reflect your average opinion, right? It's very different, but it's another survey. So now to add a little bit of complexity to the issue of self-driving car. You know that if you're riding a self-driving car, there might be situations where the car has to make decisions. And some decisions might be difficult. So the car, on average, will be faster than you to react, will probably have a better view or a better sense of what is happening. So let's assume that this is a good car. I'm not talking about crappy automated cars. You have a very good car, but nonetheless, that sometimes there's something happening that you couldn't just forecast. And you, as a human, would probably have made a disaster. So running over someone or crashing into a wall. Now the car is self-driven, so it has to make a decision. The other option is not to make any decision, which is a decision itself, right? So you have to choose. So if we accept the idea there will be self-driving cars and trucks, it means that there has to be some software which makes decisions in our place. And this decision must be somehow ethical. And that's the, if you want, the modern instanti instantiation of the iRobot scenario. Okay, there's a car and has to decide whether to steer and uh, risk to run over one person or hit uh, the three, that, that's the, something which goes under the name of the trolley problem in the philosophical literature. Yes, please. But, uh, also, uh, I imagine that the cars will be connected at some point, so where Yeah, but they will not be connected to people, I mean, in the sense that you cannot move them away from your right. way, right? So, so if, if someone is crossing the, the road. I mean, that, for example, uh, you have two drivers, and one takes one decision, one takes another, but they don't have, they are not aware of each other's decision. If they are self-driving cars, they are at some point connected. Fine, but this, what I want to say is that this addresses just a limited part of the spectrum of things that can happen, especially when there, there's a space which is uh, shared between walkers uh, and uh, just like in real cities, right? Okay. Uh, so that, that, these are the challenging situations. Otherwise, if you are in a, on the highway, that, that's much easier. That's why people is pushing a lot on this for trucks. Because the, the range of possible situations is much more, more controlled. Um, I have just I mean, an observation that popped out of my mind at this very moment. Let's assume that uh, even if a fair car company, a fully automated car, makes a decision in order to minimize damage, let's say, uh, in any ways uh, crashes on a wall, or, or, I mean, there is any way an accident and someone, someone dies. In this case, who takes the legal responsibility? Totally open issue. Totally open issue. That, that's one. Of, that's one of the biggest concrete hurdles to develop in that direction. I, I totally agree. But let let's abstract from this for a moment and, and see. Uh, so the first point is that what can, how should this algorithm work that makes decision? So some people came with proposals. So this is taken from the uh, MIT website. That this is the called the Moral Machine. It's a very simple device, which just uh, you can log. You can just uh, log into that that page, and it proposes you several scenarios. Okay, and asks you what what you would do as a driver. And these are harsh choices, right? Should I 
go left or right, there will be damage anyway. Uh, what would I do? And, and then collecting many, many data, the idea, the idea is that just to build a, what physicists would call the mean field morality, okay? <laughs> Accounting for fluctuations also, okay, perhaps. And then use this perhaps as a template for how cars should be. That, that's the suggestion. I'm not saying that it's, it's good or bad. Uh, it's, it's actually very different, what is interesting, it's very different what people decide sitting on a chair in front of the screen and say, okay, let me evaluate this. Uh, oh, okay, but this is a doctor. Okay, then I will do this. <laughs> if, if you do, there are some reckless psychology experiments in which people are confronted with a sort of recreated virtual reality in which they feel like they are controlling the real thing. So they saw a video of a train and they were sort of put in the condition that they had to maneuver this thing and they, they were really believing the thing was happening. And so there was a, a, a track like this, and then it was just uh, two, two roads. There were two uh, workers on one road and three workers on the other. Okay? And then the train is going in the direction, and it's going to go in the way that, of the three workers. And then if you act on this and you are left to the side, you should rationally say, okay, it's a lesser impact if I switch on the other right, and I, and I kill two people rather than three. So can you imagine what people did in this situation, in this real experiment? Yes, that's what they do. They freeze. They freeze. Because just, it's a decision. But if you do, anything you do will be a responsibility. It will be you killing two or three people. Now the conundrum is that you cannot do that with a machine. Or you can decide, you can randomize the choice, you can yeah, there are many things, okay, many, many things. But it's a, it's a totally open problem how to tackle these things in a proper way. We don't think, we just don't think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it, but it is, I mean, because sometimes you have to write down it's because instructions. Because humans have not solved these moral dilemmas ourselves. So, and we can solve them, probably. Yeah. But we are facing that it again in a, in another from another angle, which I think it's also instructive, especially for philosophers. Uh, absolutely. The problem is that the weaknesses are so. Yeah, just a couple of interventions. Uh, something came to my mind at the moment you said uh, randomizing because uh, okay, in a, in a dilemma like that where a computer has to choose between saving people or not saving people. Uh, how, how again, coming back at the, at the topic of ethics, how do we program the, the artificial intelligence? And if you said, okay, randomize or choose the less deaths, is that your fault as the programmer of the, uh, of the artificial again, intelligence? This, this is not, not moving away from the problem of responsibility. Is the responsibility in the hands of the owner of the car? Is it in the uh, car maker, in the people who wrote uh, the bit, that bit of code? Uh, who decided? The lawmaker which decides this has to be morality for cars. Okay. And then again, uh, let me just add another layer which is pretty creepy. It's following one. Now, assume these cars are on the market. Okay. And then I go and buy my car and then uh, the, the company says, okay, you know, for 10,000 euros, you can buy this car, which has our uh, life saving software. Uh, nobody gets killed with that, etc. Uh, of course, there will be a situation in which uh, uh, this car decides to crash and kill you and your children. I'll never tell, tell you that, but that, that's what's going to happen because that was better for the algorithm, right? But if you put on top another 2,000 euros, I can give you the version plus. <laughs> Doesn't kill you. Oh. I have nothing to add. Well, it looks like a very complicated scenario. There is even something more, in fact, because if you think about the systems of AI that we have, uh, it's very likely that uh, this system will have some self-evolving capabilities, so they will learn from experience. So at a certain point, since the problem is there's no uh, car manufacturer, which will be able to tell you exactly what the AI is going to do. It's going to be, it's likely to be unpredictable, yes. And that, that's, that's, again, the issue that we were raising before. Some, we talk about AI like we can understand how it thinks, but we 
Don't really, okay? Concerning the example that you have just made of the luxury version of the car that doesn't kill you, my personal opinion on this is that this is only a new way to, you know, a new way to represent diversities that already exist in society. It's, um, all, I mean, like uh, I have read many articles about um, superhumanism, the fact that in 20, 50, 80 years we will be able to enhance our own bodies with machine-like devices, and this poses great problems of diversity, because of course if I am rich I can afford, you know, a better body, basically I can live 150 years, while if I am poor I cannot. And unfortunately, unfortunately this is not a problem, I mean, it's also a problem regarding ethics, but it's just a reflection under new means of diversities which are already there in society. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's just, it's just blowing it up to scale, yeah, okay? Exactly. It's just an... Uh, increasing the, the inequality, making it even more apparent, and uh, yeah, uh, totally I totally agree. I think that, uh, as in the example of the car, I think that in this case, these kind of algorithms should be standardized, meaning that... that, that oh, yeah, sure. That's exactly what, uh, for instance, the government in the U.S. is doing throughout all the fields. More regulations. Uh, is that irony? Because maybe I'm a no. machine that I cannot. <laughs> no. Okay. Someone no, can explain it's, it's the joke to me. It's very difficult to go towards the direction of enforcing more regulations now. It's, it's extremely. You can, can you imagine? Really, you should enforce not only throughout the state, throughout the world. All the cars should, should get the same, share the same ethical standard in order to avoid. Inequalities. Is that feasible? It's highly unstable as a system. It's highly unstable. Uh, yes, it's highly unstable, but I mean, if there is a damage minimizing algorithm, it should be the same. What, yes, what of it, course. What's beautiful is, is that you're so young. And, no, no, no. <laughs> yes, I know that and we hopeful. can. <laughs> no, no, but it's good. It's good. I like it. Sixteen of the Cold War and uh, the way that Chelsea has more or less tried to avoid, I mean, uh, using uh, atomic weapons. So, I mean, it's it's highly unstable, but think uh, I mean it is still possible perhaps to to enforce global rules. And if we are facing global problems which are threatening I, us, I hope, so. I hope very much so. Yeah, the the deterrence principle uh, applied to cars. <laughs> okay, so. Do you know that the name of this doctor is Med? Yes. Med. Yeah. 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 Sure. The deterrence, yes. So let, let's, it's taking already a lot of time. As I know you have to leave, so you feel free to, to leave at any time. Don't worry. Uh, so then we, we move to the more existential like uh, aspect of all this, right? So we will, will ever AI be human like? Uh, this connects with what we just said. Machines, we, perhaps there's a future ahead of us in which we, we connect more with machines. It would be superhuman or posthuman, which is the best scenario in which just uh, we are swept away. Mm -hmm. uh, or just a scenario in which we have to choose whether we want to be pets or cattle, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the option. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be inferior organism, you can be a pet, uh, be nicely treated, or you can be cattle, uh, mm -hmm. okay? Oh, all these things are, are pretty much. But the interesting thing is that, is that there are some pr more practical questions that emerge in this, this thing. So one thing that I always ask, is, and it's very, it's very interesting, is can I, AI be creative? And I usually get all sorts of answers. So who thinks that an in artificial intelligence now can be creative? Of course, it's what, what is creativity, right? But, but we don't define it. I'm just asking the question. Who thinks it could be creative? Okay. Who thinks it, it is not and, and will never be? Okay, this is a possibility. Okay, so I'm showing you this, this picture. So do you know who's the painter for this picture? Google. Yeah, Google Van Gogh. No, that's not the Van Gogh painting, sorry. Yeah. This is just a simple algorithm, actually, that reads images from a repertoire of Van Gogh uh, paintings. Okay. 
This is the real Van Gogh painting. And then it reads it and extracts features out of it. So basically learns the style. And then applies it to another picture, which is just the picture of the Necker River. Uh, this is just a photograph. And then combining these things, that is, seeing this picture with the eyes of those features, it constructs something which is looks like Van Gogh painted the River Necker. But you said it's called, it's, it learned the style of Van Gogh, so it doesn't develop the style of Van Gogh. But it comes. Suppose that you can learn styles of uh, 2,000 or 20,000 painters and then start combining them in ways. That's exactly, so, that's uh, exactly the question. That. That's exactly the question about creativity. What is creativity? Yeah. Yeah. If, if you assume, if you assume, and, and it's, this is an operational definition, that creativity is the ability to combine things which seem unrelated and then you connect them and you mix them and you create something which is new but it's a combination of other things among many possible combinations and then this is creativity. Then if you, if you refuse that you will have to say that creativity is something like uh, more spiritual and there's a gap between the ability of knowing many things and then combining them together in, uh, in something which is new to your eyes. My definition of creativity would be similar to what you said but with an exception that the creativity for me is the ability of creating new roots or mixing old roots into new ones to express something. To express something that could be an emotion, a message, or also just to impress and show your, or boost your skills. Something that requires a will. Yeah, I know. That, that's to create emotion. This is a very basic example. Now there are AIs who are writing texts, producing short movies, and these things can cause emotions, explore different states of our emotionality. So that, that it's, yeah, again, like I say, it's, it's, what is expression? It's, it means that you have an emotion, you wish to apply it, and you share it with the rest of the world. Then, but it seems here that there is a problem of information, so, Let's say that you have a space and you're connecting different elements of this space, but you're staying within this space. Mm. And uh, somehow, I mean, you get this amount. Uh, so what is information? Okay, but can, but that's, that's, that's exactly the question. So a creative human mind goes out of the space? Yeah, exactly. Does it? Yeah, that's the question. So. That's the question. Okay. And, so but can. in this case, I mean, uh, I mean, we have built somehow this space. So okay. why was it existing in the beginning of time? or? Are we creating information? No, no I, I have a, personally, but again, it's not, not something, I have a very basic understanding of creativity, which is pretty much combinatorial. So I tend to be on the side of a spectrum in which a new thing is just because there are some people who have very good knowledge of many things and are able to say, okay, this thing connects to this one and then we, we come to, to something which is new in the sense that this relation was not drawn before. But that's, again, that's my, my, my own viewpoint. It doesn't mean anything more than this. I would like to, to, to attach to the, to the example of art, because, uh, okay, you, you said that the, the machine could learn 2,000 different styles, but the, the point with the style of, of Van Gogh is, for example, I see that, that thing, and I, it, it, it uh, transmits me a deep sadness that the painter is trying to okay. can, can we go one step deeper then? Uh, yeah, this is
Thank you. So let, let's uh, let's go a little bit deeper than. Sorry, uh, we, we have to finish. Up. It's going to take forever. Uh, so let, let's go a little, little bit deeper. So with some examples which are less probably uh, obvious than than the painting. And so when we talk about credit, so do we understand what are the processes that go into artificial intelligence? Like Luca was saying before, in most cases we don't. So many algorithms which do such very complex tasks. So we understand the principle, but in the essence, many of them are black boxes, <laughs> which produce some. And to give you an idea, of course, of why this is, or what, this is an example we discussed already in the lectures, right? So it's about Go. And you, you already seen this, uh, the, the, the surprise shown by Lee Settle when, when that move is made. So it's certainly something that, if it's not emotion on the side, of the machine is certainly something which produces emotions of surprise in the person outside. So perhaps you might take this as an example of creativity, right? It's something, again, out of combinations, something, yeah. I think this is different from creativity, because I think this is more like um, the space, the second space of code is much smaller compared to other algorithms. I think this piece of pipe because the machine finds another mode to minimize, because Okay, but maybe. Yeah. Let me give another another example. So this is an app which you can download on your on your phone, and uh, it can translate about one hundred languages into one hundred other languages. So how many dictionaries do you think are loaded in this Google Translate? No, known is too much. Come on, <laughs> you have to start from somewhere here. It works offline. It works offline, sure. I mean, there, there, there's one simple estimate, right? If you have n languages, it should be n times n minus one divided by two. Okay, or you know, if there are reverse dictionaries, okay. Fine. It's a lot. I mean, it would be ten thousand dictionaries. Now, actually, the number of dictionaries that are loaded is of the order of the number of languages. So it scales linearly with the number of languages. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not using one reference languages to which you connect all of them and then go back. It's not the way it works. Yeah. But what does that mean? I mean, uh, to, to extract patterns from the languages. Yeah. So in practice, what it does is that, okay, so this was the example, it creates its own language. So rather than going from the source language to the translated language in a direct way, it goes all the way up to the semantic language. So it understands the meaning of the sentence. And then in its own language, this interlingua, which nobody speaks except Google Translate, it goes down to the other language. Okay? So it has developed its own language, which we don't understand. We just understand the outcomes of that. Okay. So do we understand how machines think? No, we don't. By some engineer, by Google, or? No, 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 no. This is not something that has been constructed like this. It has emerged from the fact that there was a deep network taking out examples and then extracting syntactic features from it. Okay? Of course, this is something which is ongoing research, but this is basically, this, to this mechanism, people ascribe the great improvement uh, that Google Translate has undergone in the, in the last months. No, you're shaking your head. You don't, you don't agree. No, you're surprised or you disagree? Both. Both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
That's good. Okay. So uh, then we come to, to this, this. Yeah, sure. No, no, just to ask. So how does it create? So it's one language and then populates all the other. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way. That's the way. You, you, you just, you just, if you have many languages like this, you don't have to have a fully connected graph, which is the way you would do it if you had n square dictionary. You just need a path, right? You need a path, and from that path, you just go up, and if you create, this is enough to connect all these languages, then they extract meaning out of these sentences, which is on this other level, and then go down. It creates really a, a meta level, which is not simply the, the direct translation level. So, like I said, in many dystopic scenario, uh, you have this, this variety of options in which there is either the nasty superintelligence and we have to, to fight it and escape from it. This is a classic in, uh, in the science fiction literature. Or we have some more integrative scenario in which there will be a compenetration of uh, humans and machines, or we have this other class of scenarios, this is by Sentinel Man, in which everything goes as always, so you eat your cereals in the morning, except that now there are robots around. Okay. And honestly, this is less credible than that. Yeah. Okay? Because things will, will happen in the meanwhile. Of course, people have been asking lots of questions about superintelligence and whether this will lead us to an existential catastrophe. Is this an issue, really? Should we really worry about this, or, or is there anything else that we should care more about? Uh, so one thing is that sharing information. More or less? No, there's a mic. Uh, it's cracking. Now, this is, this is a very inter in, interesting panel from the Future of Life Institute. This is that often we have many mythical worries about the fact that um, uh, super intelligence is possible or impossible, uh, AI will turn conscious. These are really mythical worries. There are much more concrete problems. Uh, one of them, which I think is, is the most important of us and has, has a clear uh, uh, immediate inter interpretation, is this one. Machine will become more competent and that's the genie problem, right? If you ask for something, you will get exactly what you ask for. So we have to ask machines right things. We have to teach machines common sense. These are the challenges. To implement goals which are sufficiently defined in order for them to learn and performing them well, but meanwhile providing them general boundaries so that in this effort of getting the goal done, they don't just overlook everything else. This is an open challenge to design something like this. Okay, so and this is this is one of the basic message. That's why we are here to discuss about it, to 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 think about it, to be aware, to not necessarily to predict, but to be able and conscious about what, what's ahead of us. And what's ahead of us might be, like we said, a post-human future in which machines overcome, or a transhuman future, which is I think it, it's probably a reasonable scenario. Now, some things already happen, right? So there are these exoskeletons. Okay, so this is a, a completely an integration between a machine and a person. It's doing a very trivial job because it's just, it's just measuring the muscular force and helping the worker to keep the drill up for many, many hours. Okay? So this work is a very demanding work because you have to drill some... some uh, uh, the screwdriver that, that you have to apply many, many times a day. And this is just interacting with the body and helping the musculature to keep relaxed while doing this job. And it's, an, it's in a very interactive way, okay? It's not something that is just like the robot doing a repeated set of actions. It's just interacting with the, with the, the person. If the person bends, the robot will adapt, okay? So this is a way of integrating machines and uh, uh, humans. And this is an even more interesting example, again, from Johns Hopkins. So this is a robotic hand, which is attached to a stump. So this is controlled by, by the person. All these movements are just 
controlled by the person through these sensors, which measure different things like tension of the musculature, electric car currents, okay? So this is a real bionic stuff, for real, okay? And it's around the corner. And of course, in this transhuman scenario in which machines and uh, men actually merge together rather than uh, facing a competition where one would take over the other, there are inter very interesting issues. So this is in, in the nature issue of a few weeks ago. Four ethical priorities for the integration of neurotechnologies and AI. And these are privacy. If you have a machine which reads your brain without information you want to share willingly, how can you protect those that you don't want to share? Identity. If I have a prosthetic arm and, and this just hits someone, is it me or is it the arm? Agency. This is the, the fact that what, what I did, identity is, am I the same person as before if I have a large part of myself replaced by a robot or am I a different person? All, this, all these are totally open questions. And then, and we go back to the final point, equality. Because this, once again, and this is the final message, serious, serious risk about artificial intelligence, the explosion of inequalities across the globe. And that would be by far the, the worst scenario, the worst possible scenario. So by this I conclude. Thank you for the conversation. I hope the outcome would be that you are interested in knowing more. And if you want to know more, don't ask me, okay? <laughs> Thank you.